our next speaker is Dr. Saptarishi Chaudhary from Light and Matter Physics, and he'll be talking about spins. Thank you. At the beginning, I must thank the organizers. Actually, I realize I'm also part of one of the organizing committee. <laughs> but, uh, OK. Uh, so um, I only do a very few things. So I talk about them again and again. So I apologize for not giving a very technical talk. But still, I have gathered together some 50 slides. Let's see how much of this I go through. Means please ask me question in the uh, middle. I would like to answer. Um, another thing is that it's wonderful to listen to a talk about glass at the first session. So some of my uh, papers for which I think I got the job was actually on glass uh, because uh, I worked with uh, so-called uh, glassy transitions in cold atoms and so on and uh, some important papers came out of it. I'm not going to talk about them today. Uh, I'm going to talk about spins rather. So uh, because this is something what uh, we have worked quite a lot over the past uh, two, three years in RRI. Ours is a relatively new laboratory. You will see some of the progress in the laboratory. And along the way, I will also show you some of the nice pictures and uh, some of the nice structures which are making us very interesting going forward, interested going forward. So uh, some research programs at the so-called QMix group or quantum mixture group. So our focus is with uh, mixtures of cold sodium and potassium atoms. So we do study and continue to study correlation at ultra cold mass and spin imbalanced uh, quantum gases uh, at uh, very, very low temperature where quantum properties dominate or have classical properties. And Sagar has submitted his PhD synopsis day before yesterday. And uh, so he will uh, show majority of this work was uh, thanks to Sagar. Of course, Sanjuska uh, started this um, idea of this experiment together with me. Anirban, Gaurav, Shairi, Shornabho, and also Oishi, who is a visiting student now. Uh, they are all contributing to this experiment. Then I would focus a bit today on what is called spin noise spectroscopy with uh, cold atoms. And I also realized that we do some of the hot stuff as well. So I added this as hot and cold atom. So Maheshwar, who has uh, made a PhD thesis out of this work and currently a postdoc as Weizmann Institute in Israel. So his uh, thesis uh, has a lot of detail about the beginning days of this cold atom. Shairi is uh, looking at some very exciting next generation cold uh, and hot uh, spin correlation results. I will present some of them. Uh, there is a, a visiting student, Krishnanand, who is also working with her at the present. And none of this would have been possible without the theoretical support of Dibendu, who is not here. Uh, and of course, Anjukta and Mugundan have contributed technologically a lot for us to develop these uh, techniques. And then there is another uh, very interesting thing which somehow motivated because of my past work with uh, glasses to look at the transport properties of, um, of atoms at very cold temperature. And then this project is also metamorph or, or transforming itself into looking in some quantum diffusion and impurity problem and a lot of support theoretically from Suporna, Raphael Sorkin and the experiment is uh, supported uh, by ideas by Sanjukta who herself had looked into, looked into the transport properties during her previous postdoctoral work. Urbushi Satpati have made a lot of contribution. They are all our collaborators. Onirban is taking forward this uh, quantum diffusion uh, studies and also Shubhajit who has submitted his PhD thesis, thesis will be submitted soon, have uh, started some of the experiment with us. 
Then there is a very exciting direction, which is new for us, actually new for practically everyone in the world. Uh, so this is all these trapped cold atoms in structured optical potential to study the many body physics, which uh, is uh, the direction I am hoping that in few years to come, many other groups will jump into it. But uh, let's hope that we make some initial contribution to this. So Goro Pal's uh, PhD thesis work is in the direction. And then something very close to me, which uh, actually makes uh, my research motivating for myself is to look into quantum magnetism and uh, uh, few body physics. Uh, so, uh, so theory and experimental work I'm doing with uh, PhD student Shornabho Barui. I don't know if he's there. And uh, then uh, collaborating with Shubhadeep De, who is in Ayuka, Sanjukta. And there was a BTEC and MSc thesis on some preliminary results on the quantum Monte Carlo simulations and some experiments what we are going to do now uh, with uh, Digvijay Kumar, who has gone to University of Amsterdam for his PhD. Okay, so another few things I want to talk about uh, 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 that, uh, see this comes under some kind of a light matter interaction. This is one of the themes in RRI, I understand, but uh, my research, for example, during my PhD, I was in a group which used to be called uh, high energy gravitation physics, whatever it means. And uh, we ended up uh, making what is called the coldest matter in the universe, both Einstein condensate. So, so this is not uh, really a very nice way to classify one's research. And also then one of my first postdoc in equal normal superior, I joined the group where uh, uh, there was a laser cooling Nobel Prize and so on was awarded. And then we ended up doing a lot of quantum chemistry with cold heteronuclear molecules. So, uh, so that is why I would like to uh, stay a bit open and uh, make connections between different part of physics. They are all connected by the same theme. All right, so some of the recent publication along the lines which are coming up and uh, if someone is interested to go into more detail, I would like them to uh, see uh, some of the references and more will come up very soon. We are quite excited about that. These are over the past three, four years. And then Maheshwar thesis will also be available in the library soon. That also has a lot of details. All right, so let's get into this. But before that, this is a very interesting image what Gaurav gave me day before or yesterday. Uh, uh, what is it? We are creating holographic projection of the laser light and we are actually shining them into cold atoms to order atoms in space uh, uh, that will come later. So this is a hologram of the, of the laser light which is used for trapping and cooling atom to structure the atoms in space. And, uh, and then what is interesting about that, these are of course uh, uh, for fun and uh, looks nice on the screen. But uh, more importantly, we can actually manipulate atoms at will. And uh, so this is uh, one thing what I will touch upon uh, towards the end. Okay, so. Oh, so these uh, still, uh, we have a uh, little bit of diffractions and so on. So what you are looking at the level where diffraction limits around 2.4 micrometer, what we measure comes into picture. We are getting into the level where we can actually trap these cold atoms in a, in a, right. Oh, yes. No, no, this had some, yes, yes. So what we do is that there is something called microelectromechanical systems, which are called MEMS devices. So these are 1000 by 800 tiny micro mirrors, like three micron by three micron size. You shine light onto them and then you program the mirrors to flip up, flip down, and then create in the Fraunhofer plane and hologram and lots of fun and a very serious level of programming. But uh, Gaurav is doing a lot of fun with that. Uh, so, uh, and, and practically you give us anything, we will put it there. Means uh, it, it's not trivial, but uh, 
but I will not get into that detail. But uh, now we have hopefully mastered this art of creating arbitrary patterns. So, and this happened very fast over the past month, month and half. So, anyway, so uh, I was wondering what to talk about in this uh, uh, seminar. And then my daughter asked me, you know, everyone is giving talk, what you are talking about? I said, it's about spin. So then she said, oh, so you practically need a bunch of things with spins. And then she brought quite a few from her toy basket. And uh, those are the things which you can spin. And I will be talking about things which spins in the lab. So and, uh, and actually, if I deviate from this picture of spin, please stop me and, uh, and say that, uh, uh, because that, that's the picture I have. That's the picture of spin I think every one of you have. And that's, I think, the correct picture. We will make very crazy connections with atoms and electrons and so on. But eventually, at the end of the day, I think that is a correct picture of things which are spinning. OK, so this is again a very uh, strange way of depicting an atom. So there is a nucleus, then electrons are moving around. They are orbiting. They have a, what is called orbit, uh, orbital angular momentum. So that's also a vector, something very close to spin. Then electrons will have some spin, you know, spin up or spin down. Nucleus will also have some spin. And then all these spins inside an atom interact. And then eventually there are things like fine structure, uh, atomic physics 101. And then there are things called J, another vector, which is orbital plus spin uh, angular momentum of electron. Drawn, and then the total angular momentum of atom, which is also something very similar to a spin that we call F. Don't worry about this terminology. And then it gives rise to hyperfine structure and so on. So that's atomic physics done in uh, five minutes. So then, uh, so what happens in a complicated atom, hydrogen-like, let's say, rubidium, there you have the outermost electron, which has those spins and this also orbital angular momentum. And you have all the energy level, principal quantum number, then so-called S state, the ground state, or the L equal to one state. And then there is optical connection or transition between ground state and excited state. And then all these hyperfine levels I have seen, you can, uh, you can label them F equal to one or two, depending on uh, means how you put all this number. And then there are optical transitions between different hyperfine level. And if you put these atoms in magnetic field, then the so-called Gman levels or the projection of the vector on a quantization axis, they split up their energies. And you have all these degeneracies. And we end up calling these things as atomic spins. Means, and they have exactly the same picture what I showed at the beginning. But uh, here it is in the y-axis is energy. So how these energies are different and so on. So uh, the connection is clear, I hope. All right, so these are our spins. And this is how now, because these are a little bit easier to study with lasers and sophisticated uh, detection devices. So let's move on. Now let me zoom only this part. Since I say these are spins, so I would look how an atom make a transition from this spin state to this spin state this to this, so this arrow didn't come up. I was, and so, of course, they cannot make a transition from minus 2 to my plus 2 because of spin angular momentum preservation. But they can do some kind of laser ladder transitions. And these spins are uh, always jumping from one state to another state. And that's what is happening inside the atom. We can't see them as easily as the rotating top. But that's exactly what is happening. And why these populations? fluctuate between different demand level, there are various reasons. There can be thermal bath coupling, there can be quantum fluctuations which are causing them to fluctuate, there can be spin exchange collisions and so on and so forth. We will not get into too much of that uh, at this moment. Okay, so now you put such a spin in an external magnetic field, what happens? The, if the magnetic field is like this, you can apply very precise external magnetic field in the lab. The spins will be precessing. And this precision of the spin uh, with respect to the external quantization axis. And uh, this is known as a Larmor precision. This is also known to everyone. 
and then what is happening is that because of this Larmor precision, another uh, little bit of connected uh, uh, concept which was again con um, is introduced by, uh, by Faraday long, long time back is that there is something called a Faraday rotation. You have such an active medium, you have a magnetic field and then if light comes with a very well defined polarization vector, some magic happens and then there is a rotation of the uh, polarization axis of the light, uh, light and this is a pure magic. Huh? I do not know of any magician who can do something better than this that uh, something comes with electric field oscillating in space and uh, after some point the electric field oscillation angle rotates means you cannot have a better magician uh, to do this anyway. So then another little detour I will do. So I said this spin state, I have now drawn them side by side, not up down and different agreements say MF01 and they are separated in energy. Sorry, I always forget to draw the y axis, this is energy and then there is tiny energy difference. If you send a light beam, the light beam has an energy, the frequency of the photon times h and that energy uh, need not necessarily be connecting between the ground state and excited state. And even more, if one laser is used, then the distance between mf equal to minus 1 to mf equal to 0 upstairs, that distance is different than this distance. So the same light uh, for the right circular polarized and left circular polarized, uh, they are differently detuned. So what it means, when the light passes through, the phase shift in con uh, encountered by the uh, circular polarized light, which is left or right, they are different. So when they come out, they actually again uh, uh, combine together and then the overall linear polarization vector changes. So this is the explanation of that pure magic of Faraday rotation. I think every one of you know, but I just wanted to repeat it. And uh, so uh, there are some details how to connect LCP, RCP to sigma plus sigma minus, I will not get into that. Okay, so this is clear from an atomic physicist explanation. So let us not get into chirality and other things. So then what we do, we send this light, we pass it through this magical devices called polarizing beam splitter, which splits the P and S polarized light. And then we look at two detector, detector one, detector two. We do some kind of two point correlation studies. Again, this was explained very well by previous talks. And then what you can do, suppose you don't even do correlation studies, just look at the difference between these two signal. If the magnetic field is not applied, I make sure that a linear polarized light coming and which is split 50-50, then the polarization angle is slightly shifted if I apply a magnetic field because of Faraday rotation, then this will no longer be 50-50. So the difference signal will not remain zero and then we will see a difference between zero magnetic field case, non-zero magnetic field case. So we will be able to detect the Faraday rotation and uh, of course in real life these things are not that straight, there are noise and other things. So we have made some such measurement with cold atom, we pass this light through cold atom, we also change the frequency of the laser as I explained before, the frequency of the laser uh, will play a role to have a magnitude of the Faraday rotation and these things are nicely seen with that black curve where the Faraday rotation signal is very clearly seen and on top of this I just wanted to see the absorption line for the laser frequency just to tell you that I am not showing you some kind of a you know concocted. Uh, what is the direction of the magnetic field in this case? Or you are oh that? yes, that is a good question because I will do a little bit of uh, uh, sorcery. So now I have applied the magnetic field collinear with the uh, okay, vector of the laser and this is known as Faraday geometry and later on I will go into a geometry which is called void geometry where the magnetic field is perpendicular. So now the handedness of the chirality is decided by, uh, if you switch the direction the handedness changes yes, right? Yes, so absolutely, absolutely. So this is an important question will come. axial direction is a bit confusing. There is, there is, I will come to that, so that is why I said that please hold on this question. This is actually something at the heart of uh, all this 
right? We'll come to vector magnetometry and this kind of thing. And hold on this question, I understand exactly what you want. Okay, so now another little detour uh, that, uh, you know, we just had some noise sometimes back uh, and I love noise because noise uh, teach you a lot. So even again, let's go back very old, uh, look at the Holmes law and you have a noisy uh, situation and you can actually have a register with a voltage and current applied because of finite temperature, this resistance will have uh, some current and voltage will be fluctuating a little bit. And uh, Nyquist Johnson told us that if you measure the variance of that fluctuating voltage, which you measured, you can actually measure the quantity resistance. And uh, so that is how this is connected with temperature and Boltzmann constant. So that means you don't re actually have to measure uh, the um, Ohm's law, which is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, trust me, uh, though you have done this experiment in your BSc and MSc, but that is a much more difficult experiment to do than measuring the noise on the voltage, which is easier. So from the noise measurement, you can actually find the resistance rather than uh, V by I, which is, uh, which is not easy. Okay, so now I come to uh, marrying this field, uh, spins and noise in the spins, and then correlation and then finding some useful quantity out of it. <coughs> because that is what was taught in the yeah. BSc MSc laboratory. Fluctuations are actually easier to measure in the lab because they are coming naturally. You will see that. So, okay, so we now simplify our system of all those magnetic substrate and we say this is one of the MF state, that is another MF state and they are separated by some frequency given by the magnetic field which is lifting the degeneracy and the population of these two states quantum mechanically, let's say I allow them to fluctuate. So that means the, the uh, spin uh, function is also uh, fluctuating over time. The average is zero over long time but then uh, uh, the spins are sometimes uh, this population is more, sometimes this population is more. For whatever reason, let us not worry quantum fluctuation, classical fluctuation. Okay, so another way I have this sample, they may be cold atom, hot atom, maybe uh, may whatever. Uh, and then we send this light which can be decomposed in the like LCP, RCP and then we are actually seeing the polarization fluctuation just because of the uh, population fluctuation instead of magnetic field switch of switch on now because that's another handle, right? And then this is a fluctuation and then this fluctuation will show some kind of a damping behavior with time uh, if you look at the single atom with a characteristic time scale which is not in, in condensed matter community known as spin relaxation time T2. There is something T1 I will not describe and anyway, so now this is proportional to actually the Larmor precision frequency in an applied magnetic field. Uh, uh, Pramod will be alarmed seeing the magnetic field is perpendicular because I have played with the quantization axis. But trust me at this stage, you can still project the spins and uh, go to a spin projection or quantum projection measurement, this works. And then, uh, and then, then is exponential decay of the spin state with a characteristic time. And then you do some kind of a binary thinking uh, approach and find in the frequency space a uh, signal which is Lorentzian, which is peaking at Larmor precision frequency, which is a very good measure of the magnetic field also. And the width is the uh, spin decay time scale. Those two are very fantastic, uh, um, uh, in, uh, let's say, quantity of interest for present day precision measurement and so on. Anyway, so this is our measurement. First set was done in a vapor cell, then in cold atom. I will tell about this later. Now, okay, so these things you have known. And this is the signal you see, which you expect with the cartoon you have seen here. Now, here is the real one. Uh, play, pay attention to the units. This is in nanovolt per square root of hertz. And uh, uh, means those of you who do experiment, 
looking at a signal with such a ultra high precision is something uh, serious. We do these things well, so I will not get into detail of how we do the electronics measurements and so on. So that is why you can see a very narrow, very sharp tipped noise signal in the frequency domain and uh, from there we can extract a lot of information about this. Okay, so uh, another thing is that in our experiment we have two types of rubidium atom, two isotopes rubidium 87, rubidium 85 and we do see signal from both species. The strength of the signal tells us the isotope abundance. You can even take a signal from a bomb let us say and a very very small quantity of uh, some component which is uh, making a bomb uh, can also be detected like this non-invasively and so on. Anyway, so let us go a bit. We published a few paper where you change the magnetic field look yeah. Yeah, so this is this is an isotope abundance measurements in some sense. So suppose there is a yes, so you, you take a bomb with you in airport and I can send a probe like this which is far off resonant and still detect without opening up your bag. So that is where the bomb analogy. This is a nothing to do with rubidium, it is just a model system. Anyway, so, um, so then uh, as you are very clearly understanding, if I change the magnetic field, the peak position will be shifting around by measuring precisely the peak position, you should be able to also know the magnetic field, the ULTA experiment and you want to know the magnetic field for various reasons. Suppose there is iron ore just below RRI, if I take my device and see oh there is a very big shift of the signal then you know that this is where you should be starting to dig and find some uh, magnetic material or something like that. So magnetometer is an important. Okay, so we measured quite a few atomic physics parameters like the G factors very very precisely this bracket is actually uh, the error bars this is much better than. So, uh, uh, your measurement is very precise, yeah, mm -hmm. this nanovolt uh, mm -hmm. per uh, mm -hmm. square root of hertz. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you are mentioning about detecting the magnetic field, mm. uh, I see that like with uh, significant variation of magnetic field, the uh, I mean the height is not changing that no, much. Uh, right? Height is not the measure of magnetic field, the okay. Larmor frequency. So, in order to measure the magnetic field, you need to oh, know I the see. peak position. The height is actually a quantity which depends on many other things like even okay. the light matter interaction uh -huh. parameter. Okay. So, this we characterize separately. Oh. The magnetic field comes I out see. separately, I will show it actually okay. because one part of this some of our funding agencies are very interested about precise quantum sensing of magnetic field mm -hmm. though that is not my main motivation or oh, this is recorded no. But anyway, uh, so, uh, so, but this is, uh, this is one okay. of the interest actually because so for that, uh, frequency domain that shift is that's very, 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 very precisely. I will show you something what we also recently developed a technique which makes this even more precise. So anyway, that is thanks to Raman actually. So anyway, so these are things and surprisingly enough these things are uh, even recent times they were quite well publishable uh, because uh, you know there are too many things to do in physics uh, and you are never getting scooped because uh, there are people uh, who have their own interest and uh, so uh, anyway um, so these are new ideas and you can use it for measuring. You can even go to very high field and see the quadratic Zeeman effect which are known as um, what is it known as? Uh, this uh, bright ruby regimes and so on and from there you can actually see the e nuclear spin co contribution to this uh, spin noise spectroscopy and then you we have a very precise measurement this is a snapshot of some measurements we have taken and then we can fit using bright ruby formula and what we can see is that from the fit we get a very high precision uh, the nuclear G factor measurement also and then in turn the magnetic field. So I am not getting into all this detail because these are experiment plus some uh, theoretical analysis which leaves as they are. 
So then another interesting thing, if you look at the small term in the bright ruby, which is the nuclear coupling between the Yeah, yeah, that's what. So, so that, yeah, yeah, this is impressive. The, um, sorry, because see the 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 distance between these levels, which are in red. Uh, so this is in f equal to one, and f equal to one and f equal to two. If you remember, this is happening because nuclear moment i plus s or i minus s. Now this separation, if you do a optical spectroscopy or microwave spectroscopy or even radio frequency spectroscopy, those are not precise enough. But if you do a correlation spectroscopy or spin fluctuation, then the tiny distance between 0 to minus 1 downstairs and tiny distance between 0 to minus 1 upstairs, that is not supposed to be there, means not measurable. That also you can detect via, you can see here. See, for example, this is a transition in magnetic space and they are separated and that separation also precisely you can measure and you can actually measure the nuclear G factor. So, which is inspiring means you know, we can get into doing only this, but then this is another realm which is called precision spectroscopy precision measurement again this is recorded, but I do not want to do that either. So, but these are one of the most precise measurements of nuclear G factor. So anyway, so this we can measure, good. Then another thing is that we can do vector and time resolved magnetometry because the spin noise signal depending on Voigt and Faraday geometry by defining the quantization axis and projection of the spin quantum number, you can actually see and model how the both width and the peak position shifts as a function of longitudinal, I am sorry this is still in some laboratory measurements see this is actually magnetic field variation and then uh, you can actually some explanation is given I have written some uh, paper and then what we can do is that you can actually measure from there the direction of the magnetic field that is usually the unknown quantity in the lab right and very precisely again. Now we have de developed a new device which actually takes this uh, unknown magnetic field, the magnetic field which is defining quantization axis. Now here you do not know, so I, I discuss about amplitude, that is a good quantity to measure, but also if the magnetic field moves from here to there, this you should, yes or maybe, yeah, you do not have control or you can even have control and you want to measure and all this. Another thing is that suppose we can take this two time correlation signal in time snapshot, we could manage to do something of the order of 100 millisecond and now Shairi is making this optimized to even microsecond level. So where if a changing magnetic field, you can track and these are the peak position, these yellow things, frequency offset and then from there you can measure. Like your heart is typically giving this electrical signal producing magnetic field, which is strong enough actually to see outside. And then if you have a healthy heart, then this magnetic field variation will be something. And then if you have an unhealthy heart, then there will be some magnetic field jitters and so on, which you should be able to measure. Shift either because of the direction of the magnetic field or because of the strength of the magnetic field. Correct. How, mm -hmm. do, you, how do you tell which is which? Yes, yes. Uh, not yet, I, I do not know. Uh, so in laboratory environment, uh, I can control it because we have this magnetic shielding, uh, like mu matter shield and all these things, but this is a very good question. Means I, I hope someday maybe th uh, some idea will come up which will distinguish between the shift because of the direction change or the amplitude change. But uh, good point uh, because all you have is this. Okay, so another few things which might be of interest is that the population between the different hyperfine state that can vary, that can vary because of various reason, one very important reason why it can vary is gravitational field because you take these atoms very, very cold, these atoms if you take from ground floor to first floor, the gravitational field has changed and that actually causes the population of the uh, different hyperfine state to change and that is the reason, sorry, that is the heart of what is called gravimeters, right and people end up measuring this population shifts 
Now what they do, they have these atoms, they measure uh, at the ground floor, they launch them with a you know laser beam uh, inside the vacuum and then they measure again. So these are the, like the destructive measurement. Ours are not destructive measurement. What we can do, we can actually see as I had shown without any optical transfer of atoms from one state to another state, uh, we see all possible six manifold lines in case of rubidium. Some other complicated atoms you may see more. And then if I have a transfer of atoms from one state to another, here we do artificially what is called an optical pumping. And then once the population shifts, I can actually see two of them go away. And then I can, I know that all the atoms are here. I do the same thing uh, the opposite way. And then we can actually see that four other noise peaks go away. And then I am left with this. So this is a very nice in situ measurement of the uh, uh, hyperfine state population and then this also is kind of a measure of other quantity. I just gave gravimeter as an example. There may be other interactions. Any interaction can transfer population from one state to another. Here we do artificially, but suppose some other way. All right. So this happened. Then another thing, thanks to Raman. Uh, so what we did was that you see that this, uh, where was it? Yeah. Sorry. Again, I see. Huh. See, these levels, they are now thermally or quantum mechanically or spin exchange collisionally connected. Suppose you, you force them to go from one state to another state, but uh, do not do a single photon dissipative uh, transfer, but do a two photon Raman transfer between the two states. And if you do the two photon Raman transfer between the two states, you get into something known as a um, uh, lambda type of system. Sanjukta talked a lot about this. These are also mechanism by electromagnetically induced transparency and so on. I will not get into there. And now if you do this kind of two photon transition in this lambda case, you can actually couple these two magnetic substrates. Once you couple these two magnetic substrates, what you can do means these are theories developed by Dibbendu and they are no way trivial. They are like solving some 36 coupled differential equation together and so on because once you have this complexity, but he did it. He is uh, great at doing those things. And then you can actually have a very strong going from this uh, nanovolt per square root of hertz or here I am plotting it in the PSD, um, the pico volt square per hertz to uh, nearly million fold increase in the spin correlation signal. And by doing that, we can actually measure this uh, spin envelope much, much more precisely because now our signal to noise ratio have improved like anything because we are actually forcing the spin oscillation and we are also scanning the so-called frequency detuning between the two Raman levels. Okay, detail uh, you can discuss with me later and then after doing that again some uh, so what we have demonstrated is that we are actually measuring the coherence time of the spins by having such a precise control over the spin decoherence. And these are again, uh, you know, I just wanted to show to demonstrate how hard we work, but uh, uh, just, uh, uh, okay. So now uh, uh, this was some kind of a holy grail to see in case of cold atoms, they are protected against spin diffusion, whether we can measure a live spin fluctuation time scale, what kind of time scale it is because nothing is forever, right? They, they. So then we wanted to measure the spin fluctuation and I added this first ever direct uh, detection. Uh, anyway, so these are the cold atoms, you see the uh, image and then you shine light and Raman beam pair through them and then practically the same measurement, you have the magneto-optically trapped cold atom, you have a probe laser, you can move the probe laser in different places, apply different magnetic fields for which you have coils and then you can actually measure this and we can see the spin correlation width in the frequency space which is typically of the order of uh, less than a millisecond that uh, sorry less than a kilohertz that means the inverse of that is like millisecond 
So cold atoms are living in a particular spin state more than a millisecond. This is like eternity because atoms typically decay in microsecond or sub microsecond time scale. So you are talking about you know one hour and one thousand hour uh, that. So if, if the spins are your qubits, then you can actually do many many times all this qubit operation and so on by making this kind of measurement and then in thermal case we typically see microsecond spin coherence lifetime by doing this measurement in case of cold atom this is in the millisecond so suppose you want uh, quantum computers with spins being the qubit which is a very promising direction and then we can do this measurement some uh, newspapers like times of india wanted to highlight that they didn't even ask me and ran some uh, an article saying that uh, you know, Indian researchers discovered long-lived quantum correlation for quantum uh, computation. So uh, anyway, so then later, uh, of course. So now uh, I come to another interesting thing which Shairi is doing. So you you make very high quality shielding of any stray magnetic field, and then you can actually see that you can naturally reduce the uh, coherence width. That means increase the uh, spin lifetime, yeah. <laughs> oh, this is the probe. Uh, so, sorry, this uh, this blue is the is the Raman beam pair. The red is actually the probe, and we make sure the Raman beam goes uh, through the cloud. Uh, in a direction where there is no detector, the arrow on the red which we focus, that comes and detector is here. We are very careful not to make any stray amount of Raman light fall on the detector because that will ruin everything. So those things, that's to manipulate my spin population and other things and this is shielded in a magnetic uh, shields and other things. And you can see the spin correlation signal at high field, high frequency means high field, uh, this is wide enough, means this is still 40 kilohertz and then they are becoming very, very narrow. So that is a natural way saying that you are getting more protected uh, uh, and this is what is called so-called spin exchange relaxation free regime. So then, you know, she was giving me this data yesterday, day before, where we are seeing the how the spin noise width is reducing with magnetic field, sorry, magnetic coil current will change it into magnetic field. And that's uh, that's why I say the very promising regime to explore spin-spin correlation, uh, practical advantage in magnetometer sensitivity and so on, which I'm not touching. Uh, good, so another thing, how much time do I have? I have still a minute, five, okay, great. So I wanted to highlight this because this is something what I learned a lot from Suporna, Raphael, Urboshi, Satpathi over the course of this experiment. We have these cold atoms and then we move the cold atoms uh, using some perturbation and then uh, the perturbed cloud position, this is the projection of the cloud position and we see how it evolves in this driven dissipative trap and then their uh, suggestion is that we should measure some kind of response function of this cold atom in presence of perturbation. We did that, we actually measured the position response function, velocity response function also of this cold atom at different uh, domain and then uh, some very interesting result came up and which we are also allowing us to go to the next step in the true quantum domain. And then with Onirban, uh, what we are doing, we are taking this experiment forward, we are actually going to measure the response function in presence of a tunable interatomic interaction. The tunability comes via going close to a molecular transitions, which actually uh, we were, I mean, so when I was a postdoc, uh, we were the very first people who measured the ultra cold molecules. This was reported, uh, sorry, I forgot the year. I think that came around 2011. Uh, so now these signals, I'm not telling what they are, but they are actually identified molecule position for different sets of atom, lithium, potassium. Uh, we are having a sodium potassium machine where uh, molecular spectroscopy lines, don't worry about them. They are like a jungle, but we will go to close to one of the strong molecular line. This will make sure this cold atoms will 
feel much more attraction with each other close to a molecular resonance and they will change the damping coefficient at that regime and there we should be able to see how an atom moves in the bath of another species and which is uh, probably going to give some insights into the basic physics uh, of that. So this is one thing. So he has already built up the lasers and everything which are needed for this. We have this cold atom things. I'll show some pictures. So this is the one which is actually my one of the main focus. So this is a simultaneous laser cooling of two species, which is mass and spin imbalance. And then we have a very efficient production, one of the best now in the world. I'm getting lots of uh, emails from uh, many people. And we have very high lifetime of this cold atom there in seconds. And uh, then we actually trap more than 10 billion potassium. And uh, so that these numbers are impressive because we have that much strong signals for whatever you want to measure. So you would like to have more of the good things. Uh, less of the bad things. So then we are preparing for simultaneous evaporative cooling to have large mixtures of DECs. Those are uh, the things. So this is the schematic of the machine. And uh, this is also uh, how we create this uh, very fast uh, loading of cold atoms. Uh, this, this is where we actually uh, win over uh, some other groups where we have devised some uh, technological advantage in RRI, uh, thanks to also workshop and other things. So these are some of the snapshots of the laboratory picture, zillions of optics, high precision spectroscopy, and then the ultra high vacuum uh, laser, uh, system at the center of the table, another view from another side. You can also see this micro electromechanical device which we create the structure from. And uh, then these are actually the uh, light coming out of the cold atoms which are trapped inside the vacuum chamber using this uh, fast loading technique. So two species simultaneously sodium and potassium and both of them are uh, access of billions. Uh, sodium a bit less because sodium has some uh, intrinsic issues but um, anyway. So then also we use some really uh, uh, technique to enhance the the atom capture rate inside the uh, ultra high vacuum technique. I have not discussed anything about laser cooling techniques because these things are non-trivial, but uh, they I don't want to bore you by techniques that we do all the day. So we have measured what are the optimized uh, performance of this kind of machine. Hopefully that many future generation experiments will follow this kind of uh, um, uh, techniques to create large number of cold atoms together. Uh, and then how we detect, we have these cold atoms uh, like a cloud, we send uh, near resonant light and then that falls on CCD image plate and you see a dark shadow and the darkness of the shadow, extent of the shadow tells you everything. How is the temperature, what's the uh, um, atom number, density and so on. So you can see. Also you see there is lots of noise because of this uh, laser interference etc. And we have now developed with Gorob again a technique to denoise this thing. That's why I need some help from the high performance computing because we take a lot of uh, images, uh, huge data and we follow certain procedures. This is actually machine learning and artificial intelligence technique. The, the algorithm learns from a uh, huge amount of image data and then uh, we actually can denoise this cloud image and you can see the signal to noise ratio really improves with standard desktop with these images takes go up around hour or so with uh, high performance computing access we will probably be doing this uh, in milliseconds. So, um, so anyway, so this, uh, this is the workhorse for all the measurement. Okay, so if I have two minutes, I want to show this. This is the direction what is making me so excited. So these are called DMD, the MEMS based uh, mirrors, but they are not one mirror, they are like uh, 10,000 uh, by 800 mirrors and you shine light onto that and then that light is what is used as an optical tweezer to trap an atom and that light 
we have a high time resolution of around 100 microsecond full frame. If we go to small frame, then uh, we can even go faster. And this is, uh, these things are available now to buy. They were not available maybe five, 10 years ago uh, with this such a high power and high time resolution, ease of interfacing. And now we can create uh, the pattern on the trapping light. And then we are actually creating arbitrary optical potential for cold atom. There is a tremendous possibility uh, to simulate again condensed matter physics. Uh, of course, I, I love to belong to condensed matter, but anyway, uh, so we can see the, and then there is a new direction for quantum architecture, how to, uh, how to produce that. So some of this, so as you saw, those dark things are actually the atoms. And once we superimpose this kind of pattern onto these atoms, and this is yesterday, and we are still optimizing so some square blocks, then some circles, and you can see the atoms are now getting ordered in space. And this is nice to see now, but later on, if we allow tunneling between atoms from one uh, site to another site, and then we can see the quantum evolution in a potential. For example, you want to do a calculation with a very crazy potential, give me the potential, Gaurav will program it, put it onto the atom, and you want to see what is the ground state of the quantum this thing. Okay, so conclusion. So this is a new state of the art machine to experimentally study ultra cold atomic gases, sanctum sanctorium, actually this laboratory. Uh, novel measurement technique to explore spin dynamics. I mean, this is uh, applications include quantum sensing with high precision and high time resolution. Experiment to connect generalized Langevin treatment with cold atom measurement, thanks to Suporna, Shanjukta, Raphael. This we have done, uh, but we are continuing in the true quantum domain. Then cold atoms in structured potential. We are studying many body physics in arbitrary geometry and dimensionality. So I have to thank Ibrahim, a lot of these things because RRI uh, didn't give me much space and, uh, and money initially, so I had to make it practically everything. So Ibrahim helped, uh, Mina, Shujata, lots of electronics, RRI workshop, uh, administration, purchase section, estate, building, Shachin, Munisharan, means, you know, uh, some things, for example, I can either complain or solve it, they solved it. Uh, so there is no point complaining because, so then all the funding supports, uh, uh, secretarial support, and also uh, the fantastic progress in the Redbug team keeps us motivated actually uh, to also match in the Cumix. Uh, so Chanjukta, Shilpa, Shobhan. So that's all I wanted to say, uh, some questions. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And uh, so suppose I want to put now atoms there. Yes. That and atoms. Uh, no, now atoms. I want to put a dynamics there. Mm -hmm. so, so what do I do? We are doing this. No, no. The lattice is fixed. Lattice is fixed. Oh, you don't want dynamical uh, No. Change. And I want some dynamics of atoms hoppings on the lattice. So uh, traditionally, if you see the, the Bose-Hubbard or even Hubbard model simulations mm -hmm. uh, from the groups of Immanuel Bloch at all. Uh, so they have created the static lattice using interfering trapping beams. Uh, we even in Florence did something. Uh, on top of that, we have introduced uh, disorder by putting some kind of bichromatic lattice. Let's not get into detail. And then we can tune interaction via a technique called feshback resonance. So this is one thing we have designed now for the interspecies and intraspecies interaction that depends on an external magnetic field. So now you write Hubbard, Hubbard model so you minus put T. A, you can put a AI diagram AJ with yeah. IJ nearest exactly. neighbor exactly. Yeah. and you can put You it. can also do uh, far than well, nearest, neighbor, the nearest, but nearest neighbor. Nearest neighbor, that's the goal. And then you can tune U, okay. U by two, uh, ni ni minus one yeah. ni also you can tune by trapping how many atoms you want per lattice side okay. you tune u by 
tuning an external magnetic field you tune t or j means depending on what you like j is the tunneling i like j by uh, changing the lattice depth switching sorry increasing or decreasing the uh, laser intensity and then uh, you actually can see after some time the atoms will tunnel depending on u if u is very high i wanted to show and you let's uh, yeah. see you have uh, this so this many many lattice mm -hmm. now the uh, this is the let's say uh, one atom watt insulator and now if you allow tunneling let's say j and then the interaction u uh, this uh, for bosons you can go even to uh, 3 4 whatever you want mm -hmm. uh, now of course what you can do if u is uh, much much higher than j you can actually make it insulator and you actually can and people have done that uh, and uh, then uh, means we also have done that uh, but uh, so that's like uh, so it's easier here now yes huh? i hope so okay. because you you can have much more parameters and your atoms can be both you can make both boson like or fermion like yeah, no no not like we can uh, have both have both because uh, you know i paid a lot to give, get an isotope enriched potassium 40 okay. and that was a uh, that was really something uh, tribute to purchase section because this is radioactive and uh, I bought it from a Canadian company and US company actually put this in a uh, in an ampule and sand. So we have both bosons and fermions. And you can load it from one side. You can load it from one side, you can load it from all the sides. When actually, I take an empty lattice, I put the bath on one side and you see how the lattice filled yes, up. Yes, you yes. Can, and you can do it in 1D, you can do it in 2D, you can do it in 3D. The Langevin equation that you hmm. have. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, are these? So, are you look. So, if you looked at a classical random walk, right? Versus so, a so there. Versus their, a quantum random. So, their paper was is, quantum Langevin. So, yeah. we used the one generalized quantum Langevin, but then what we looked at the xi prime uh, in this particular experiment was zero. So, Raphael's point was that at the end of the day, we ended up looking at fluctuation dissipation theorem, which I agree, uh, but the mechanism and uh, that is one reason why with Anirban, we are going into this uh, uh, regime where even the xi prime term also we can put non-zero. And that is where that is where actually the most interesting thing because this experiment is actually designed to look into the quantum Langevin. Right. So I mean, can you think of it also as a quantum random walk? Uh, it is actually it is, really it is. Quantum yeah, yeah that that is. For example, then you know whether we have an exponential localization or the exponential localization with uh, quadratic. Uh, tail. Uh, so, the, the, this is what we are look, trying to yeah. look. So, so, basically a quantum open system where you it have is a, a quantum, CP, CP hmm, map yeah. evolution or true, something true. like that. No, yes, I, I do not want to promise too much because these experiments are hard, but I, I would love to do that because even this was not so easy. This is actually a tribute to the kind of measurements and so on what uh, people have taken, but then people need to stay focused. We have ended up seeing just the linear, uh, but that's that was the hope. And Supurna always wanted to see. Yes, is there some deviation? But um, but we want to see. Yes, I think we need to go down. So actually, eventually, we need to go to what is known as this uh, Landau-Picker regime, where you have one impurity in the bath of uh, a pure quantum and then you, you want to see how that impurity. So, in this case, uh, let us say sodium atom is an impurity in presence of a potassium Bose-Einstein condensate and you want to see the how the sodium atom is diffusing and log T is what we want to see. Only problem is that it is expected at a very long time and uh, now as you go very long time, even when you are uh, nano Kelvin temperature, the cloud will expand a bit. So, the signal to noise will become a little bit uh, issue. So, that is the reason why 
uh, why we are developing this thing. Uh, yeah, because you know, you would like to see this cloud with much less, uh, because you know, if you take an image like this and log t or t square will look very similar if the signal to noise is not great. So, so these are like some muscle building to see um, uh, what to do, yeah. I have a question related to that. Uh, because the problem is you have the spectral light which gives hmm. you noise. Hmm. Why not use incoherent light to create a shadow? Mm, see, the problem is creating a very narrow frequency domain incoherent light is hard. See, the idea is the, the light which is used for absorption imaging, uh, they need to be frequency narrowed uh, to address the particular transition. And we are talking about uh, kilohertz level frequency stability. Now, having an uh, incoherent light in spectral domain, which is also having uh, something like uh, tens of hundreds of kilohertz uh, line width, such source are not there. Uh, with a laser, this is possible. So, one idea along your lines, I am thinking with Gorob, uh, is that create such a special incoherence, at least not temporal, by this, uh, these uh, DMDs. Uh, so, somehow to introduce an incoherence, uh, but I have to learn a lot, you know, this optics and atom light interaction books to transfer a special incoherence to optical incoherence, I, I need a lot to learn. So, but you know, Raman is there, so hopefully, <laughs> okay, so 